Open up your Bibles to Acts chapter 15, and we're going to continue our study there, Acts chapter 15. And um, as you turn there, I want you to consider with me for a minute uh, some of the defining moments in your life. We, it's been said that we, we really only have a handful of truly defining moments in our lives, and I bet you right away can think of what some of those might be. When I think of those defining moments, I think of my wedding day. I, you know, think of um, my first child being born. I, I, I think of um, the day that I got saved, that I became a Christian. And, you know, and, and I'm sure that you have a handful as well as you look back over the course of your life. But, but uh, the thing about defining moments is uh, those are... Uh, the, defining in the sense that uh, there was a critical decision that was made at that point. And it was based on something that, that you believed or someone else believed. And, and your life was never the same. And I've entitled the message this morning, A Defining Moment, and, it, and it's in church history. And, and the reason is because in a similar way, we're going to see in this story that something happened and it was based on what people believed. And there can be, and, and that can be for good, that can be for bad. There, there you know, some defining moments in, in life are, you know, we don't, we don't remember fondly. And, and it's important that we understand this, this chapter in the Bible is a very significant one. And uh, you'll see why as we, as we go through. You remember Paul and Barnabas had just returned from their first missionary trip and they had gone through this region known as Galatia. And... Um, they had come back and reported to the church that had their sending church, which was in Antioch. Antioch is to the north of Israel in Syria, what we, and, and along the coast there, along the Mediterranean, and um, that's that's where uh, they were, and and the church that sent them out, and they come back and they report all that the Lord has been doing in and through their lives, and. Um, at some point, we don't know exactly how long, but at some point thereafter, there were certain people that came down from Jerusalem to the church in Antioch, and uh, that's what we're going to be the focus of, of this uh, chapter, and you're going to see a theme, uh, and if you don't see, uh, well, you may not see it, I, I want to draw it to your attention because it, it's really important, and it is just the conflict. You could just kind of put as a title, maybe another title over this chapter, Conflict among Christians. I thought about titling it that, but uh, I don't want that to be the focus, but I, I do want you to be aware of it. Conflict among Christians, that's the context. And we're going to see that, that there's a sense in which that happens corporately as a church, and then toward the end of the chapter, we're, or at the end of the chapter, we're going to see it also happens individually between a couple of individuals. And, and I just, I think... Uh, by the end, you'll agree it's good and it's helpful that this story and these examples are here for us in Scripture because here, I don't know if you do this, but sometimes um, I, when I envision the early church, it's a little bit through rose-colored glasses. I mean, I, do you ever do that? You think of the old church, it's just like, oh, if we could just get back to the days of the early church, you know? And we think of Pentecost, and we think of, you know, all the miracles, and just these incredible things that God did, and we think of Acts 2, where it says, that, you know, they, they had all things in common, and they loved each other, and it's like everybody just walked six inches off the ground, you know, and there's this aura about them. But you need to understand this. If you're paying attention to the story, it was messy. Not just because of persecution from without, but because of strife from within. Remember, we've seen that toggle back and forth, that dynamic of, of how the enemy is working. You know, if he can't get you in a frontal attack, he's, he's okay with trying a different approach. It'll be more, you know, kind of subversive and, and internal and... And so it, it's, uh, it's messy. And in that way, it relates to our lives. I, I like the fact that the Bible is, is um, honest and yet hopeful in uh, the way God tells his story. So let's pick it up in verse 1. It says, And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, Unless you're circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas 
and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and elders about this question. So being sent on their way by the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and the elders. They reported all things that God had done with them. But some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up, saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. And so we're going to look at verse 1 here uh, to start out. Certain men came down from Judea. Now, everything was down from Judea. Part of that is just geographically, uh, Jerusalem sits on a hill. It's not the highest point in the country by any means, but, but geographically, it's just like when you went anywhere else, it was down. Now, when we say, uh, we say we go up to Canada, we go down to California, and we kind of look at it that way, but they're a little bit different. It, geographically, it's just everything's kind of up to Jerusalem. But more, um, m- more symbolically, it's like God's there. I mean, this is where the center of their religious and national life was. It was the capital of the nation, but it was also, um, it was where the temple was. And, and where, you know, so everything was kind of, uh, you know, they, these guys came down from there. And these certain men, um, I want you to keep in mind always the context of this whole sort of dynamic between Jew and Gentile and the story that's unfolding here. These men came down from Jerusalem. Now, this is a big deal. That it's it's like people from headquarters coming down. Now, we don't, because we're not a denomination per se, we don't think quite like that in our church but many churches do. If, if the, you know, the, the, the president of the denomination comes or whatever, whatever his title may be, it's kind of like a big deal. And in our church, you know, if, if Chuck Smith were to come, and he's with the Lord now, but if he were to come to Calvary Chapel Olympia, it'd be a big deal. And anything he would say would be a big deal because he's the founder of the movement. And, you know, and, and so when it says these certain men came from Jerusalem, you have to understand that they they immediately would be received with some with credibility and with some sense of of kind of awe like whoa these guys are coming from the mother church here and and so we you know and and this is this is you know for good reason because remember this is where this is where the faith was forged and established this is where the apostles were and everything they taught and the foundation for their teaching, all of it was from, from there. And also, you know, to add to that, you've got James, who is the leader of the church there in Jerusalem, and you know who he was. He was the Lord's brother. He was the brother of Jesus. He wrote the book of James, which is probably the first of, of the books that were out there available to people. And so it was a really big deal that these people came from Jerusalem. And uh, Jew and Gentile alike, Gentile alike would have been inclined to sort of receive them with open arms. However, that would not have been reciprocated to the Gentiles, as we'll see in this story. It, can you imagine these guys coming in and at church, they're welcome. And, and they listen to the teaching and everybody's just going, wow. Uh, you know, hanging on every word. And then, and then after the service, you know, Hey, why don't you come to our house for dinner? Wait a minute. You're a Gentile. See, it, it, there's, this, there's still this dynamic. You have to remember that, that there were centuries worth of, of, of a wedge kind of driven between the Jews and the Gentiles. And, and the church was was a radically new society, a new community where they, all of a sudden they're thrown together in this thing called the church and those habits and mindsets were, were hard to, to deal with at times. And so these guys came down and their motivation for preaching this message um, was, was very clear. They See, it always comes down to power and control. And they, they, they would have seen the Gentiles as being sort of this, um, we don't want them to have too much control and power in this thing called the church. And so they started to teach this message, you have to be circumcised. 
Because to the Jew, that was one of the, one of the prescriptions in the law. God told his people, they were his covenant people, and he, he symbolized that covenant with, through circumcision. You remember the story about Abraham and all of that? Well, these guys come down to this place where Paul the apostle had, a, had, had been ministering for, for a long time now and pre- preaching this message of grace. You're not saved by works. You're not saved by the law. You're saved by grace, by, by grace and uh, the grace of God and through faith, by grace through faith in Christ. And they got it, and they believed it. And, and the Jews believed it, and they became Christians, and Gentiles believed it, and they became Christians, and it was all going along just fine <laughs> until certain men came down, and they had this agenda. And so that's why I said it's a defining moment in the church. And here's the thing that you need to know about a legalist. The legalist always adds to the word of God. The more liberal-minded person, I mean, I'm, I'm not talking about your politics, I'm talking about spiritual things. The liberal takes away from the word of God, subtracts from the word of God. I mean, let me tell you what it, it would look like sort of practically when you add to the word of God, you're making the good news nothing more than good advice. It's saying, you know, uh, here's what you need to do. And it becomes burdensome to follow the Lord rather than a blessing. It becomes something that ultimately brings resentment rather than rest. And, and you have this legal relationship with God instead of a loving relationship with God. And Jesus had to rail on the Pharisees for this because the people, rather than drawing them to the Lord, they were driving people away from the Lord because they were so hung up on the letter of the law and they missed the spirit of the law. They didn't understand what God was meaning to convey through their scriptures. And here's the thing. It's hard to really love and trust a God if I'm a legalist because I'm never sure where I stand with him. Have you noticed that? Uh, and when I'm doing well, I tend to feel very self-righteous. And, and when I'm not doing well, then it's self-loathing. I'm such a loser. I just can't get this right, you know. And we just beat ourselves up. And the enemy beats us up. And, but not just ourselves. I tend, and I've told you before, I, 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 I'm ashamed to say it, but I, I'm inclined to be a Pharisee. I, I'm inclined to just be, you know, very sort of rigid in my thinking in the way that I, that I expect, you know, others to live and me to live. And God's changing that over time. But it's through the gospel of grace. I'm constantly preaching the gospel of grace to myself and, and uh, God is to me through his word. And I'm not just hard on myself, though, by nature. I tend to be hard on others. And the problem is when you're hard on others, you make them feel like they're a disappointment to God and probably a disappointment to you. But the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Do you know what that means? There's no such thing as God being disappointed. Because he, he's omniscient. He knows everything ahead of time. And knowing you were far less than perfect, he still loved you. And he died for you. And he offers forgiveness to you. And so this idea as a legalist that if I got to do something, I got to do more good works, I got to do this, I got to do that, and then God won't be disappointed in me. You know, I, I, I just think it's, I've talked to so many people over the years that, that feel like God, I'll ask them, you know, how they think God looks at them, and they, well, I think he's disappointed in me. Well, why do you say that? And they walk me through their life and all their failures, but, but do you understand that's, that's a misconcept of God? If you really chase that down and follow that logic, you're saying that somehow you caught God by surprise. He's like, I can't believe you did that again. <laughs> so disappointed in you right now. <laughs> and it's silly. You're laughing because that's ludicrous, right? But you know, it's the same way. If if I've 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 found over the years, even as a parent, sometimes I try to keep an I try to be careful about this. But it's tempting sometimes to tell my kids, you know, I'm really disappointed in you right now, if they do something wrong. But here's the thing: I don't want them to be sitting in some counselor's office twenty years from now, thinking their whole life they're just a disappointment to God. The reason, listen carefully, the reason we get disappointed isn't because. God's surprised, we're surprised. Why are we surprised? Because we don't realize just what sinners we are. 
God already knows. And he tells us ahead of time. And he doesn't want us to wallow in, in just, just condemnation and, and all this. He says, look, I'm telling you ahead of time. You need me. You really are worse than you know. <laughs> And, and just, it's, it's okay to be honest about it. I'm going to give you a great quote by a guy named Tim Keller here just in a little bit. It's just, it just is so freeing to think about. And, and just understand, it's not this like doom and gloom, uh, condemning message to confess before God and even others that, you know what? Yeah, I, I am a sinner and I need Jesus. And, and you, you can't disappoint God. You can disappoint others and you can disappoint yourself, but it's because you, you're not aware of how desperately you need the Lord. Once you become aware of that, then you don't have to worry about feeling like you're a disappointment to God and others or even to yourself. And um, so, now the liberal always subtracts from the word of God. And what, what just like the, the legalist adds to the word of God and makes it like just good advice, here's what you need to go do, the liberal-minded person subtracts from the word of God and what, what if you're inclined that way, you tend to make the Lord's commandments into mere suggestions. And so if I'm a liberal, spiritually speaking, I tend to be carnally-minded and listen, I tend to struggle with authority. I, I don't, I, I, I don't want to have anybody defining or pointing out how God is, has, de, has defined right and wrong and moral absolutes. I don't appreciate spiritual accountability to either God or, or my brothers and sisters in Christ, and I'm inclined to interpret Scripture in ways that don't prick my conscience or require me to change in deep and significant ways, see? And, and so we can, and sometimes we vacillate between the two. I do. Sometimes I, I, I hear what I want to hear and so I can do what I want to do. And, and we've just got to understand the scripture gives us a very clear, balanced view of this. On the one hand is that God tells us the truth about our sin and our need for a savior. But, but then he says, but the good news is I am that savior. And, and I will forgive. And, and nothing will separate you from my love. And, and it's, it's very freeing and very comforting to know. But these certain men, they were legalists, and they had an agenda, and their message was basically grace plus works equals salvation. And Timothy Keller says this. Uh, he says, religion, this is so helpful. Religion says, I obey, therefore, I'm accepted. And that's great for just a star chart person, you know, who's really self-disciplined and they can just, they love, they love to just give me a checklist of things to do. Just tell me what to do and I'll be very, really, I'll be a good little boy, I'll be a good little girl. And then you go around feeling, oh, I'm accepted, see? I'm doing all the right things. Grace says, I'm accepted, therefore I obey. That is entirely different. See, the Bible tells Christians that they're accepted in the beloved. They're accepted in Christ. Not on the basis of your merit and what you do, but on the basis of his and what he's already done. I love that. You know, I was thinking about this today as well and, and how the people in my life that are most like Jesus, that I admire the most, and that I've watched over a long period of time, some of my big brothers and sisters in Christ, and I watch their life. And as they grow in grace, I grow in grace. And as I watch their lives, I, I say, you know what? I learned two things from them. I, I love them more and I want to be like them. Yeah. That's what happens when you watch somebody that, that is really growing in grace. Even if you're not yet like them, you just love them more, you trust them more, and you say, I want to be like that. Uh, there's people in my life, for example, that are really gracious and, they, and I watch how they handle difficult people. And I just, and I think to myself, I could never do that, but I want to. I want to be like that. I don't say, well, I could never do that. <laughs> I, I say, wow, it, apparently it's possible. It can be done. I want to be that. I want to be like that. And, and it's not like this drudgery, or this burden. It, it, see, do you understand? I, uh, there's... There's just something about understanding 
that the relationship isn't threatened by your behavior. You know, I don't have to perform and jump through hoops. My, th- those people that are great examples to me like that, I, I just, I love them and I want to be like them and I don't have to perform for them. Well, verse two, Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them. They determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem and to the apostles and elders about this question. And um, <laughs> it says there was no small dissent. Remember, Paul and these guys had risked their lives for this gospel of grace message. And these, these guys come waltzing into town and, and they start adding and saying, well, you gotta do this, you gotta do this. You gotta be circumcised, you gotta keep the law of Moses. By the way, did you know the law of Moses isn't just the Ten Commandments? <laughs> there are 613 commandments, 613 laws governing all every aspect of their lives. There, there were ceremonial cleansings and ritual cleansings and there were, there were things that governed, um, you, know, you know, their land and their property. There were, uh, you know, just all of this stuff. And then what they did is they added to it, and this is what the, the leaders, the Pharisees did, and they, they basically had to put together this other document was, that was, well, to put it in simple terms, it was more rule, rules to know how to follow the rules. <laughs> Sound just bureaucracy. I mean, we, we <laughs> any of you work on the ledge? <laughs> and, and the thing is, this is the way that, that people, they were just tired. They were burdened. They were burnt out. They said, I don't, that's God. I don't want any part of that, you know. And so they come in with this good news, this gospel of grace, and, and people are just set free. They're like, wow, I can just... I can just rest in the love of an acceptance of Christ and I can grow in the love of Christ and I can learn to trust and obey him because I want to, not because I have to. See? That's threatened all of a sudden. Do you know what would have happened in, in church history, in world history, if, if this message would have stuck? Christianity would have become a cult. Christianity would have become just a mere sect of Judaism. It wouldn't have changed the world. It would just be another in a long list of religions. Jesus would be nothing more than another religious guru. And, and there'd be some people that he would appeal to and others not so much. Wouldn't have changed the world. Certainly wouldn't have changed people's hearts. If, if man can save himself without the grace of God, then the cross of Christ is unnecessary. Listen, if you have to add anything to what Christ did on the cross, you are essentially declaring that his sacrifice was insufficient and he actually needs you. Yeah. That wasn't enough. That didn't accomplish it. That didn't satisfy God's wrath. That didn't cover my sin. And so, so I got to do a little something extra here to kick in to make, sweeten the deal, you know, and... <laughs> Make it all possible. But if you can earn it, by definition, it's not a gift. And so they not only dissented, they disputed very strong language. In other words, they didn't agree to disagree agreeably. They said, no way, no how, not on my watch. And, and you know, they had risked their lives to bring this, this message of grace. By the way, this is, a, this is a chief tactic of, enemy, of, of, of Satan in his strategies. If outward pressure through persecution isn't going to do the trick, then inward strife will get it done. And so there's distraction through controversy. There's always been a very effective method of the enemy for keeping the church from accomplishing its mission. Listen to what J.B. Phillips said. He said, after the Muslim invasion successfully sealed off Europe, the Christian theologians of the West turned on each other in fierce doctrinal disputes. For nearly a thousand years, the church was unconcerned with many millions still untold in heathen lands. No dissertations were written against Islam, Buddhism, or Hinduism. Instead, theologians fought each other while the world perished. (laughs) Do you understand? It's only been 2,000 years since the cross, so half of that time, he's saying the church had been fighting each other while well, the world has perished. It's, it's incredible. Do, do you see now why this is a defining moment? It's absolutely essential that the apostles stand their ground against false teaching and say, absolutely not. I'm gonna fight and die on this hill if I need to. 
Well, they weren't able to reach an agreement. So verse 3, they were sent on their way. They passed through Phoenicia, Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles. It caused great joy to all the brethren. I like this. Wherever they went, they just redeemed the time by telling the gospel story, sharing with other believers all that God was up to through their lives. What uh, an encouragement they were to other believers. Paul had absolutely no intention of staying quiet on this. He, had, he was going to keep telling the story of what God was doing among the Gentiles. It was time for them to be inspired. It was time for them to preach this message, this gospel message of grace. And you know, it reminds me too that when God rescues a person and truly changes their lives, they rejoice and they tend to rejoice in other people whose lives are changed. Isn't it true? When you hear someone else's testimony, it doesn't matter how terrible they lived. The whole time you're just going, wow, yay, God. And the worse it was, the more you go, yay, God. It's just incredible what God can rescue us from. And we rejoice with those who rejoice, as the Bible says. Listen to what Paul would later write in Ephesians chapter 2 about Jew and Gentile. Ephesians 2, 11. Don't forget, says Paul, you Gentiles used to be outsiders. You were called uncircumcised heathen by the Jews who were proud of their circumcision, even though it affected only their bodies and not their hearts. In those days, you were living apart from Christ. You were excluded from the citizenship among the people of Israel, and you did not know the covenant promises God made to them. You lived in this world without God and without hope. But now you have been united with Christ Jesus. Once you were far away from God, but now you've been brought near to him through the blood of Christ. Verse 4, And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received by the church and the apostles and elders, and they reported all things that God had done with them. So there's power in testimony. By the way, I want to start doing this more. Are you guys okay with sharing testimonies? You ever been to a church where they share testimonies? I feel like we lack in that, to be honest. I, I know it happens. I know people share their stories with each other. But I want to do this more as a church, like on a Sunday. I, I want, and there's two ways I want to do it. I want to do it, I want to let people share their story on a Sunday. So from time to time, we're going to start doing that. Um, and, and I want to do it on the website. We're going to launch a new website in a couple of weeks. And on there, I'm going to have a, a whole page that's just devoted to faith stories. Maybe I'll call it grace stories. Faith or, I don't know, I haven't decided. But it's basically a testimony page. It's a way to just tell our stories. Why? For a couple of reasons. One, it brings glory to God. And two, it edifies the body. We have got to hear our stories. I never tire. We've had such a great time in our life group this year just sharing stories with one another, hearing how, what God's done and is doing in our lives together, and it's such a faith builder. The other thing it does is it helps us love each other more. Because when I hear your story and what God's doing, has, you know, what he's done in your life, what he's doing in your life, I know how to pray for you better and more often because it's just on my radar. I know how to love you better. Maybe we have something in common and I can come and encourage you or, or you can encourage me. And, and just sharing our stories is so very important. And I, it's just something I think we need to get back to. So just something I want you guys to look forward to. Uh, verse 5, some of the sect of the Pharisees who believed rose up saying, it is necessary to circumcise them and to command them to keep the law of Moses. Uh, this is the reason, by the way, why many of the apostles like Paul and Peter and John and James, they had to write letters to both instruct and, 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 and establish true doctrine and expose false doctrine and correct false doctrine. Because this, was, this, was gonna, this old habit was going to die hard. It was really hard. They were dealing with, with this heretical teaching in the church through Judaizers. Um, I remember years ago I did this thing. I wanted to communicate to kids that um, God didn't give us the Ten Commandments because he thought we could keep them. And in fact, the Bible says if you broke one, you broke them all. And I won't explain all that right now. But what I did is this little object lesson. I, I, I got this big glass um, window and I wrote on it in Sharpie the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not, and thou shalt not, and thou shalt not. And I put it up there, and, 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 I, <laughs> and I said, who thinks they can break just one? And all the boys, you know, they wanted the hammer. I had a hammer there. And so, so, and so uh, this, 
This boy gets up there and, and they're all like, you can't do it, you know. And so everybody's just waiting to see if he could just break one. And so he's kind of tapping on, on he's just going to break one. And I said, try harder. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, that's what people do is, is they, if I just try harder, if I'm just more careful. And the enemy makes you think that you can actually do this if you just try harder. And the Bible comes along and says, no, that's not, that's not why I gave you the law. I gave you the law to, to say that I'm holy and you're not. And, and it's supposed to point you to the one who's holy, which is Jesus. And you don't try harder. You put your trust in him and he begins to come in and, and change your heart and what you value and how you think. And, and yeah, behavior starts to change event, eventually, but it's not wrong behavior that's gonna keep you out of heaven. It's wrong belief. And, and over time, all of us are still sinners to this day and we'll struggle with our sinful nature all the way until we get to heaven. You might have in your mind that a particular sin is gonna keep you out of heaven. No, no, the Bible says... You're, Jesus didn't come to condemn, he came to save. You're condemned already because of sin. And he says the reason is because you won't believe. You won't believe. But if you put your faith in Christ and what he does and what he will do, all of a sudden he just changes the whole motivational structure of your heart. You, you want to please. You want to live different. I don't know if you've noticed this, but I, I did as a kid. I, to this day, I, I'm aware of this, this dynamic that I want to please my parents. If you don't want to please your parents, then something's broken. But intuitively, God hardwired us to please our parents. And I'm telling you, listen, God also hardwired us to want to please God. He's our Heavenly Father. And we want to please Him. But when the relationship's broken, we tell ourselves, I don't care what God thinks. I'm just marching to the beat of my own drum. You know, and we, 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 we deceive ourselves into thinking it really doesn't matter what God thinks or what God says. Yes, it matters a lot. But you, but you have to understand, you've, the only way that we can walk in obedience and love the only way we can desire the, to please God and do the things that honor him is if we have the power of the Holy Spirit and we have Jesus working in and through our lives and just slowly over time, we start to care about the things that he cares about. And, and we learn to grieve over sin the way he grieves and we learn to rejoice over righteousness and truth and good things the way that he does. It's just, but it's a work of the Spirit. It's so Important for us to understand this. Now the apostles, verse six, and the elders came together to consider this matter. And when there had been much dispute, Peter rose up and said to them, men and brethren, you know that a good while ago, God chose among us that by my mouth, the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. So the leaders get together to discuss this issue before them. And it doesn't take very long before this discussion turns into a dispute. Peter stands up um, in the midst of all of this commotion and reminds them, let's not trade what we do know for what we don't know. And Peter knew this, and they did too, that God had done a work through Peter and, and had called him to reach the Gentiles. And you know what Peter didn't preach when he went? Look back in the story. Remember we talked about in verse, or chapter 10 about Cornelius and, and when Peter went to Caesarea? He didn't go there. God didn't say, go to Caesarea and preach on circumcision. Go to Cornelius and preach all about the Ten Commandments. He didn't say that. He says, go and tell him that I'm bringing Jew and Gentile together and it's through this gospel message of grace. And he did it. He did it. And this, you know, he has, what, what, this is a big deal. Peter's standing up. He's the apostle Peter. Everybody knows what God did through Peter. And so what he says carries weight. And he says, you want to know what the evidence is that what I'm saying is true? Here's what it is. Verse 8. So God who knows the heart acknowledged them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us and made no distinction between us and them, purifying their hearts by faith. He says, here's what the bottom line is. It's the Holy Spirit. Not only did he not preach circumcision or preach the law, he didn't even get a finished preaching, period. Remember the story? It, the Holy Spirit interrupted his sermon. The Holy Spirit came upon them there in Caesarea 
while he was preaching. He didn't even get to finish the sermon. Verse 44 of Acts chapter 10, while Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit fell upon all those who heard the word and those of the circumcision who believed were astonished. As many as came with Peter because the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out on the Gentiles also. Just like it had happened to the Jews on Pentecost, now it happens to the Gentiles. For they heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. And Peter answered, Can anyone forbid water that these should not be baptized who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of the Lord. So if circumcision were necessary for salvation, surely the Holy Spirit would have said so. But he didn't, and that's Peter's point. And so our debt to God was paid not by religious effort, but by the substitutionary death of Christ on our behalf, on the cross. And our work is simply to trust in his work. It's the work of Christ that satisfies God's, what God requires. Now, therefore, verse 10, why do you test God by putting a yoke on the neck of the disciples, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? Since we know this to be true because it's been validated over and over again by the Holy Spirit, why do you want to play God and burden others with all of these rules which none of us has been able to keep? Our, far, our forefathers couldn't do it and we can't either. Amazing. Do you remember what Jesus said? I love this. Matthew eleven twenty eight. 28, Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens and I will give you rest. Don't you just want to go, ah. See, to the very religious person that's carrying this burden of, I got to do all these good works, it's like, ah, oh, I, I can just have this loving relationship with the Lord. To the person who's burdened by their past because they haven't been religious and they have lived like the devil, and then they're carrying the burdens of all their regrets, all of their shame, all of their guilt, all of their past, and they too can say, Ah, I can just let this go. I can let this go. Jesus said, take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I'm humble and gentle at heart and you'll find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy to bear and the burden I give you is light. It's just such beautiful words. So many of you have been saved out of religion. I've had many of you come to me over the years and tell me there are three things that you appreciate about the ministry here at Calvary Chapel, and I'm going to brag on God a little bit here. I'm not bragging on me or Chuck or anybody else. This is, this is, it's just how the Lord has worked. If you've been saved out of religion, and I'm using that in a pejorative sense, okay, the, the negative connotation of that term, religion, you, I hear three things commonly. I, I so appreciate the message of grace. I never knew it. I, I, I didn't understand what grace was and what grace wasn't, and, and I just, I appreciate grace. The second thing is, I just appreciate knowing Jesus. <laughs> I was never encouraged in my previous religion or denomination or whatever to just have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's so liberating and, and so securing and affirming to just know Jesus. And then the third thing is, we appreciate being fed the word of God. And, and how it applies in everyday life. I was never encouraged to read the Bible. Oh, I went to church all my life, but I never learned how to read and study the Bible. We didn't go through the scriptures, book by book. We just, I, we bounced around. We heard this and that and a lot of people's opinions, but I never was fed the word of God. And this is why we focus on those things. The gospel of grace, knowing and loving Jesus and one another. And the word of God, he renews our minds. And I'm not suggesting for a minute that God doesn't care about whether or not we obey his commands. I'm talking about the motivation behind it, see? The gospel is good news, not just good advice. It's a report of what he's done, not what we must do. Okay, verse 11. We believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved in the same manner as they <laughs> this is really funny to me. Interesting statement, kind of makes me smile because Peter does something subtle, but I think very intentional here to expose their folly and make his point. Everything in the Jewish mind was always to the Jew first, to the Jew first, to the Jew first. And here he reverses the order. And he says, hey, Jews, 
We're go- we believe this gospel of grace and, and so we can be saved the way the Gentiles are saved. <laughs> Do you see the little, see what he did there? It's, it's to all you religious people that think you're in with God, you're saved. He said, listen, if you don't understand the gospel of grace, you need to catch up to your understanding of what grace means and be saved like the Gentiles are now saved. Isn't that interesting? Paul talks about it in Romans, and he talks about how he, he's allowed this for a season of time because he's, he's actually provoking the Jews to jealousy. Now, listen, you have a hard time with that. Take it up with God. He said it, okay? <laughs> he, there's something he's doing. He's just saying, look, my people are stiff-necked and stubborn. I love them so much. But the only thing that's going to work with them is they're going to have to see other people getting in on this good deal and they'll realize they're just being stinkers about it and, you know, they'll come around. They'll come around. Verse 12, And all the multitude kept silent and listened to Barnabas and Paul declaring how many miracles and wonders God had worked through them among the Gentiles. And so... They had amazing stories to tell. Can you imagine listening in on Paul and Barnabas' stories of their missionary journey? Do you remember how it started? The start of their missionary journey, they run into this satanically inspired guy named uh, Bar-Jesus or Elimus. That's not something you see every day. Right out of the gates, they're dealing with Satan. And then toward the end of the journey, and all, there's a lot of drama along the way, but toward the end, Paul gets stoned. And, and, you know, they, they worship them, he and um, Barnabas, like they're Greek gods, one minute, and the next minute they stone Paul. Crazy. And uh, I just, what stories they must have had. And after they become silent, James answered, saying, men and brethren, listen to me. Simon has declared how God at first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. So here he is, this leader of the church. He happens to be one of Jesus' brothers. He picks up where Peter left off, affirms that, we, that, that God had used him to reach the Gentiles, but then he adds this point. He says, whether you believe it or not, whether you agree with it or not, the scripture agrees with it. And, 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 and then he goes on and he quotes the scripture with this, verse 15, the words of the prophets agree just as it is written, after this, I will return and will rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down. I will rebuild its ruins and, will, and I will set it up so that the rest of mankind may seek the Lord. Even all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord who does all these things, known to God from eternity are all his works. So like any faithful pastor, James takes him right to the word to find answers and solve problems and settle the dispute. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks or feels about it, but it matters what does God say. And they're, they're startled by this. It's hard to swallow for these Jews that the Gentiles are in on this, but... God's in control. He says, I did it this way on purpose. Amazing. And then I'm going to wrap up this last part real quickly. Basically, they, give, they send this letter. They give, them, they give them a few little qualifications. They say, okay, stop giving these guys a hard time. And for the record, we didn't send them. Because <laughs> they, they passed this off like they'd been sent by the mother church in Jerusalem. James says, we didn't send these guys down there to give you a hard time. This, this is their own little hidden agenda. So he calls them out. But he says, stay away from, he says, don't, don't, uh, away from meat, sacrifice to idols, things that have been strangled and have the blood in them, and sexual immorality. The reason he did this is he was, he was dealing with the cultural sensibilities and sensitivities of each group. Because he was saying, look, if you're having a barbecue, you know, with Jews, don't tell them why you got the meat. <laughs> Just enjoy your burger, okay? <laughs> and, and, and so, you know, be careful about that. And, and because that was a big deal to them. And, and they, they liked the blood in the meat. You know, they liked the juicy burger. I mean, you guys realize when you eat meat that you're eating animal muscles, right? There's blood and... I'm, I'm just... <laughs> But they liked the juicy burger, and the thing is, he said, look, don't, don't get hung up on that. Now, here's, here's my point. I'm being silly, but, but, but here's the thing. It's not about the law. It's about love. 
These guys were thrown into the life together now. It's, it's this historical moment. He said, you've got to learn to love each other. And it's not about me laying down these strict laws. It's about learning to just kind of give and take and just, you know, chill out about some things. You know, you, you, you love each other. Don't worry about where the meat comes from. It's sanctified. You pray over, you know, the fact that it was offered to idols at a temple and then got sold in the marketplace. Who cares? It's meat. Eat it. But if it stumbles your brother, then don't eat it. Just love your brother. I mean, you know, Costco's selling vegan patties that, you know, bulk. So, uh, you know, and, and, but the sexual immorality was for the sake of the, of the Gentiles because in the Greco-Roman world, sexual immorality, immorality was rampant. Temple prostitution, all of this kind of stuff. And in, in the Jewish world, it, there was very high ethical moral standards and, and it was... It was you know, I'm not saying they were perfect at it. I'm just saying they were more sensitive to that. And so for them, you know, they, the, the Gentiles weren't so much, and they needed to learn, hey, you know what? You probably shouldn't have four wives. Just saying, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> and concubines and be going to the temple prostitutes and just knock it off. That's in Christ. We don't do that. <laughs> and so, but it was about loving one another. And so um, I'm going to stop there. And next week, what we're going to do is, oh, by the way, we're going to have communion so the worship team can come back up. But, but here's the thing. I want to, I, there's another Keller quote that I want to, um, I want to say to you that I think is a great segue into communion. Because maybe like me, you're, you're a little inclined toward being a legalist. And I don't want you to despair. I don't want you to go out of here feeling beat up or, you know, like I've just wailed on you because, you know, you tend to be that way because I'm that way. And here, here's what Keller says. I love it. He says, the gospel is this. We are more sinful and flawed in ourselves than we ever dared believe. Yet at the very same time, we're more loved and accepted in Jesus Christ than we ever dared hope. I like that. And when we come to the cross and we take communion together now, here's what I want you to realize. When you look at that cross, it's the intersection of law and grace. It's, 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 it's this amazing accomplishment that only God could, could do where on the one hand, he, he pours out justice on sin. But on the other hand, he, he takes our place and, and his wrath is essentially on himself. And, and so, so justice and mercy are satisfied at the same time. So you come to the cross and, and it's a beautiful thing because while it's true, we're more sinful and flawed than we ever believed, we're also more loved and accepted than we ever did hope because Jesus sacrificed himself on that cross. He shed his blood and that's what we celebrate so kind of a defining moment, uh, to say the least, in church history. And um, I just want to encourage you, if you have never surrendered your life to Christ, maybe you don't even know exactly what that would look like, and you want to talk about that, you want prayer, and after the service today, just, just come forward. We'll have prayer team up here, and we would love to be able to, to minister and help you in that way. Those of you who are believers, and, and you know that you're in Christ, and this is, we take communion together, and um, the reason we do so is to remember the cross and uh, all of its implications in our lives. And Jesus died for the religious Pharisee, and he died for the prodigal son kind of person too, the, the, the rebel. All of us, um, you know, either need to be saved from pride one way or from pride another way. Sometimes pride leads us to just rebel and run from God. Sometimes pride looks like Look at me, I'm so much like God, and you should be too. So either way, pride can trip you up, and the cross just reminds us that he's covered all the bases. And so here's the scripture uh, of the institution of the Lord's Supper. For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he'd given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Lord, thank you for the gospel of grace. Thank you for the cross. 
Thank you, Lord, that, that we can follow your example. And as we do so, we pray that those two things would happen. As we look at you, we wouldn't feel condemned and beat up or like we're disappointing you. But instead, Lord, we'd be drawn closer to you, that we would love you more and we would desire to be more like you. Just like those people in our lives that we, we, we admire so much, we love them more and we want to be like them. And how much more should this be true with our Heavenly Father? How much more should this be true of our suffering Savior? Help us to see you like that, to just fall in love with you more. In Jesus' name, amen.